thank you all for letting me come and share with you all this afternoon. I first want to kind of start out just by asking you guys, what are the first ideas, concepts that come to your head when you hear the word hospice? End of life. End of life. Care. Care. Pain relief. Pain relief, good one. What else? Family support. Yeah. Family support. Okay. Those are all good things, and hopefully can answer a little bit more as we as we go through the presentation. Again, I'm Justin Nelson. I am one of um, five chaplains that we have with Hospice of the Carolina Foothills. I am the only chaplain that we have in the state of South Carolina. Um, we uh, Hospice of the Carolina Foothills um, has been serving Polk County, North Carolina, Greenville, Spartanburg, and Cherokee counties um, for 20 plus years. Um, and a year and a half ago, May of 2016, uh, we merged with Hospice of Rutherford County in North Carolina. Um, so now we serve still the same three counties in um, South Carolina, Spartanburg, Greenville, and Cherokee counties. And in North Carolina, we now serve um, Polk County, Rutherford, um, Rutherford County, and McDowell counties as well. Um, so you, you'll see Hospice of Rutherford some, you'll see Hospice of the Carolina Foothills some. We're all the same organization now. It's under Hospice of the Carolina Foothills. Um, one of the things we'll talk about, uh, just a brief overview, is what is hospice? And then what's the difference between hospice and palliative care? Um, our volunteers, um, we cannot run without our volunteers. Um, we have a wonderful We Honor Veterans program. Um, and then I'll talk about my journey uh, as a hospice chaplain and the things we offer for grief and support. So what is hospice? Hospice is a medieval word meaning a place for shelter for a traveler on a difficult journey. Uh, it is medical care that improves quality of life for someone whose illness, disease, or condition is unlikely to be cured. And as the bottom, normally it is a diagnosis of a terminal illness, diagnosis of six months or less. Um, however, six months is just a number. Does it really have much meaning in, in our world? Um, it, it's six months as long as the disease process goes through a normal disease process, which there is not a normal disease process. Um, I, I've been a hospice chaplain for six and a half years now, and I've had patients for close to four um, that have been on service. Um, so six months is just kind of a number that's thrown out. doesn't necessarily hold a lot of meaning. Um, each patient's individualized care plan is updated and needed to address the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs um, that often accompany that illness. Um, so there are <coughs> many parts to our team. You have a nurse that goes out at least once a week, if not uh, twice a week, three times a week, as much as needed. Um, we have a social worker that goes out and meets uh, with the patients at least once a month, if not twice a month, and more if needed, less if needed. And then myself, as the chaplain, go out to our home patients uh, at least once a month, and then more if needed. I normally make my rotation about every three weeks and get out to see all of the folks that we serve. Um, and that is solely on the home care side of things. When we have two different hospice houses, there's a sheet over there that talk about one. Um, one of our hospice houses is in Landrum. Uh, which is where my office is located, and then we have another hospice house in um, Forest City, North Carolina. Um, and so there, um, care is much more like you're in a hospital setting um, with people around the clock that are taking care of you, uh, et cetera. Uh, hospice care also offers practical support for caregivers during illness and grief support after the death. Uh, I tell family members, if you need to yell, scream, vent, uh, whatever, give me a call and I'll be that listening ear for you guys and to kind of let you relieve that stress uh, and let you verbally vomit all over me if you need to. Um, so we're there not only for the patient, but for the caregivers as well. And one of the wonderful things we do for family members especially um, is uh, Medicare provides it, Medicaid provides it, um, a five-day respite stay. And so for care, that's specifically for caregivers who are just burned out, tired, exhausted from taking care of their loved ones. Um, we're able to take their loved ones either 
uh, into one of our hospice houses or into another contracted facility uh, where they have round the clock care just to give a break uh, to those caregivers. Uh, because I know so many folks who are they're constantly and their own health starts to deteriorate because they're giving so much of their time uh, to their loved ones. Services are available to the patient and entire family when the curative measures have been exhausted and life prognosis is six months worse. Just not for cancer or adult patients. Uh, it is not surprising that people often associate hospice with cancer. In the mid 1970s, when hospice came to the U.S. Uh, most hospice patients had cancer. Today, more than half of hospice patients have, another, have other illnesses for which they are medically eligible for hospice services, such as late-stage heart disease, lung or kidney disease, and advanced Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Hospice also once was exclusively for adults. Today, many hospice programs accept infants, children, and adolescents. Um, and one of the um, benefits, especially for the children uh, and, and infants and, and those kind of things, is normally for hospice care, in order because Medicare provides and pays for it, um, you're not eligible to receive what we call curative treatment. So if, you're, if you do have cancer and are under chemo treatments, um, you're not necessarily qualified to receive hospice. So under that, Medicare pays for that versus the same thing kind of falls in the same bucket. Um, but for children and um, young adults, etc., cetera, um, that does not matter. You can still be seeking cur curative treatment um, and still have hospice care. Um, it's one of the benefits, especially for children. Um, I have many folks um, that have COPD, that they worked in a, in a mill all their lives or whatever and inhaled all of these substances and now their breathing is just gone. Um, what is the difference between hospice and palliative care? Um, the word palliative uh, comes from palliate, which means to ease or comfort. Um, it is more taking care of a symptom, um, pain management, for example. It does not serve only for the dying. Instead, it focuses more broadly on improving life and providing comfort to people of all ages with serious, chronic, and life-threatening illnesses. It provides an extra layer of support. It is appropriate at any age and at any stage in a serious illness, and it can be provided along with curative treatment. Um, unlike hospice, palliative care is not limited to patients with a six-month diagnosis or less. Um, palliative care is mainly uh, symptom management, uh, primarily. If there is a um, just a COPD patient um, who really, really cannot breathe, um, and just to get the breathing under control, but is doing better um, in all other aspects of his life, or um, a cancer patient that truly is not to the end stages yet, um, but is still having a lot, a lot of pain. Um, palliative care to steps in and is able to manage that symptom uh, where they can get out. And they still see um, one of our doctors um, once a month um, going through that process. Um, hospice cannot run without volunteers. Um, Medicaid, Medicare demands that. Um, there is a certain number of hours that volunteers have to log uh, for hospices to stay open. Um, so the roles of volunteers, and this is for anybody, um, support for patients. This can include um, visiting patients, reading, um, singing, um, supervising therapeutic visits with pets, we have pet therapy dogs um, that go to homes and also to our hospice houses, um, which one of our doctors used to have um, a therapy dog with him that he went in with every patient and they loved uh, the dog. Her name was Bella. Um, respite uh, for support for family members. Uh, many volunteers go into the homes just so the caregiver can go out and run to the grocery store or do errands, go to the bank, etc. those kind of things, just to be there with, with their loved one. Um, Fundraising, administrative work, uh, rounds, maintenance. Uh, we have volunteers that work on our gardens at the hospice house. Um, they uh, sit at our front desk and welcome folks into the hospice house. Um, do mailings, are involved in all kinds of administrative stuff. Um, we have three different uh, resale shops, thrift stores, uh, one of which is in Landrum, 
and there's one in um, Rutherford County and one in McDowell County, as well in North Carolina. Um, and volunteers help run our thrift stores, and all the thrift stores, the monies that the thrift stores raise goes to help cover um, offset costs for our two hospice houses um, that we use. Um, Faith in Action representative, we have volunteers that serve as liaison between the hospice and the local churches. Um, so they are able to inform um, their folks, their congregants, of um, what we can offer them, but also put us in touch with them if they need uh, hospice care and support. And then bereavement, which we will get to in a little bit. Volunteers may attend memorial services or visit loved ones after the patient's death to help be supportive uh, to them. We honor veterans. Um, we have a lot of veterans, um, especially, um, that become part of uh, hospice services. Some of them, especially our Vietnam vets, um, have never been thanked for their service. And a military is so much part of their life, we like to honor them for that. And so um, we honor veterans as a national hospice program um, that we are a part of. National Awareness and Action Campaign developed by National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization uh, in collaboration with the VA. Uh, encourages partnerships between community, hospice, and state hospice organizations and um, VA facilities. Uh, a vast majority of veterans are not enrolled in VA and may not be aware of the end of life services and benefits available to them. Um, we are a level four, there's different levels, one through four, uh, and we're at the top, increase access uh, and improve quality. Uh, we honor veteran participants ensure that the men and women who have been given so selflessly receive the support and compassionate care they deserve. Um, so if they're a veteran, um, our social workers especially go in and um, help them make sure they're getting the benefits they need through the VA, um, help with um, if they want uh, any military honors at their funerals, etc. Um, and then one of the things that I am blessed to be able to do um, is we uh, give little certificates of thanks. We, we print out certificates with their name on it and, and thank them for their service. It has a little emblem of which branch of service they served in, um, along with American flag pin um, that we're able to present them and give to them if they wish. Uh, and, and many, many folks, as I said, uh, have never been thanked for the service that, that they provided to this country. And, and so it, it can be a very meaningful, meaningful time uh, to them. Um, now switching gears a little bit to, to my path uh, to hospice and how I got there and what it is that I do for the company and organization. Um, just to give you some of my history and my background, uh, I am the son of a Baptist minister, um, knew that ministry was always in my future, um, just uncertain which area that was. I thought for many years it would be in youth ministry, camps, etc. Uh, did not necessarily happen that way. Uh, went to seminary after I graduated from the university here in Greenville, um, and uh, thought that that would help me discern what I wanted to do. It did not. <laughs> um, after seminary, um, my wife and I ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I was working for a hospice, but in a non-clinical uh, role. Um, was working in their foundation, helping raise money um, for the hospice. Uh, but I sat at my desk all day long and was not with patients and just was not, not the right fit. But I learned the important values and importance that hospice provided to the communities that it served. Um, so there, uh, the bravest and dumbest thing I ever did in my life was quit my job there at that hospice uh, the day I found out my wife was pregnant with our first child uh, to take an unpaid internship <laughs> at a Baptist hospital there in Jacksonville, Florida, um, what is called clinical pastoral education, uh, to learn how to do chaplaincy. And uh, from there, I went and spent a year as a chaplain resident at Emory uh, University Hospital in Atlanta, and then landed my first hospice, cha hospice chaplain position at Mountain Valley Hospice and Palliative Care in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Um, but my wife was from Spartanburg, and so we moved back to the upstate, uh, where I became uh, a chaplain here with Hospice of the Carolina Foothills. But while I was in Mount Airy, I became a board-certified chaplain for the Association of Professional Chaplains. 
The role of a hospice chaplain, uh, primarily responsibility, is to provide emotional and spiritual counseling to patients and their families. Uh, are trained to supplement the care provided by patient and family spiritual care providers. I'm not there to take the place of anybody's minister. I'm there to walk <laughs> alongside of and provide as much extra support as I can. Um, I welcome ministers to come and visit. Unfortunately, though, I, I come across many individuals uh, whose pastors do not come to see them, and, and that upsets them, so I'm able to kind of take on uh, that role for them, uh, which is helpful to them. Uh, our members of the hospice interdisciplinary team submit written reports on patients and interactions. Every two weeks, we just had it this morning, uh, we sit down with the doctor, the nurse, social worker, our volunteer coordinator, Everybody sits down together and talks about the care uh, of their patients and what they need, uh, uh, what is, what's happening to make sure we're giving them the best care uh, that we can give them. Um, act as liaisons between members of clergy and hospice patients. Uh, many patients want me to contact their church uh, for them and, and to, so that their ministers can come out and visit them. Um, so, and kind of pass information between hospice and the church. Um, very, very important, and this is what I fight constantly. Um, we have no spiritual agenda. We're not there to push our own beliefs on anybody. Um, we're there to walk alongside them in their journey. This is not my journey. Uh, it's not anybody else's journey. It's their journey. And, and we're there um, to provide care to that individual. Um, concerns are addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Visits in the home, a minimum of one time per month, and in our hospice houses, at least once a week. Uh, meeting the needs of the patients with different beliefs and cultures, as I just said. Um, chaplains have been trained to provide spiritual support for people in diverse settings. Uh, contacting other faith tradition leaders for support of patient. I, um, call, constantly contacting our uh, local Catholic priests, getting them to come by to perform sacraments. Uh, to patients, especially in our hospice houses, um, <clears throat> contact Jewish rabbis, imams, or Muslim patients. Um, try to be there in whatever way we can uh, to help them. Listening without judgment, uh, and as again, helping guide the patient on their journey. This is not, this is their journey, not yours, not mine. Um, so a lot of times, especially when I was in the hospital <coughs> settings and those kind of things, um, there were things that not necessarily my faith tradition does. But it's not about my faith tradition. Um, so um, performing infant baptisms, anointing with oil, whatever they want, and will make them find the comfort and peace that they need, that's what we're there to do. Um, grief and bereavement support. Um, not only am I a chaplain, I'm also the bereavement coordinator uh, for Hospice of the Carolina Foothills. Uh, additionally, chaplains provide bereavement services, including phone calls and visits. Uh, we follow family members uh, after the day of death for at least for up to 13 months um, to make sure they get through that first year, especially the holidays, etc. cetera. Um, for those, we have uh, seven different letters um, that go out um, through the year that talk about loss and grief and how to kind of navigate that first year uh, of losing a loved one. Um, uh, we make initial phone call, which I felt to say a ago, about three to six weeks after the date of death um, to give time for reality to kind of set in, family members go home, support kind of lessons a little bit just to see where they are and where we can help, and then follow them through that year. Um, and then we have Hope Group. Uh, we uh, have a bereavement group that meets every other month um, in four different locations. Uh, in South Carolina, we meet at our hospice house, which is in Landrum. And um, we meet about every other month. We're meeting this week on the Tuesdays of the month at 6 o'clock in the evening. Um, and uh, it is not just for folks we serve. It is for community folks as well. Um, so if you yourself know someone that's going through a hard time, just lost a loved one, and think a grief group would be helpful to them, they're more than welcome to come and participate. Um, we also do community bereavement. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be anyone on our service but someone in the community has lost their loved ones and is really having a hard time, you can give me a call and I'll go out and meet, meet with them. Um, does not have to be attached uh, to hospice services. And then for children, uh, once a year we have Camp Aaron, uh, which is a yearly camp for children who have experienced grief. Um, therefore, this um, 
camp is held up in the mountains of North Carolina uh, once a year and uh, is a wonderful experience for kids to get together and uh, have fun but also talk about their experience of losing their loved ones, uh, whether it's a parent, grandparent, whatever. And then once a year, um, we do a memorial service um, that uh, for all of the folks that we have lost in that past year. And families are welcome to attend. They're able to send in pictures, and we do a PowerPoint presentation um, with all of their pictures up on screen so they can see them and, and um, memorialize them a little bit more. Um, any questions? Is there a choice for Camp Aaron? Hmm? Is there a choice for Camp Aaron? I don't think so. It is free. Are you the, um, the only hospice provider in Middle County? No. Okay. No. Just to give you some information on that, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, where half of our half of our hospice serves. Um, is what is called a certificate of need state where you have to petition the state to be able to open a hospice there has to be a need and so it cuts down on competition <clears throat> South Carolina is not a certificate of need state and so there are hundreds and hundreds of hospices uh, in the area um, you have for-profit hospices and you have not-for-profit hospices as well we are a not-for-profit hospice but there are multiple um, and you can now, and there's a sheet over there um, that talks about um, hospice comparisons. Um, you can actually, there's a website, and I'm not sure of it off the top of my head right now, that you can go to and look at different scores for all the hospices in your area and compare them um, to pick which one you might want to have for um, your loved one. So if there's more than one option mm -hmm. and a hospital recommends that, did they rotate the list, or how do you... How do you no. Hospitals that? kind of use the same ones. And if you want one that the hospital doesn't say, you have the right to say, I don't want that hospice, I want this hospice. So it, it is completely the family's choice on, on what you want and what you need. Um, but there are um, hospices on almost every street corner, and it, in South Carolina, competition is huge. And um, even in nursing homes and assisted livings and those kind of things, um, they have their preferred hospices, and some only like to let one hospice <coughs> come in because um, we have contracts with facilities. Um, but again, uh, the families have the right to say, no, I don't want this hospice, I don't want another hospice. So that's good information to know um, that just because a hospital says, this is the hospice we're calling in for you, doesn't mean you have to use that hospice. I have one more question. Yeah. No, no, no. I have, my mother-in-law just went to hospice, so okay. I don't know. Then feel free. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how come you guys don't have a list that says, like, hospice number one, hospice number two, hospice number three, hospice number four, hospice number five, hospice number six? Like, what is the last several years, and it would have been a great help to my sister-in-law, who was her primary caregiver, but yet they were, they refused to take it. Palliative care is really a new concept, theoretically, and most of the time it's lumped in with hospice, unfortunately, and it is just, it, it, truly, better education needs to be informed to hospitals and those kind of places. Um, about palliative care because a lot of times you hear hospice and palliative care and it's kind of lumped into one when it's two really completely different things and um, one of the great things about palliative care especially if it is attached to a hospice is you can keep track of a patient and when they are um, declining and truly hospice appropriate then they can come on to hospice services and then if we have many, many, many folks that graduate hospice that no longer meet criteria to, you know, to be on our services, and they're able to go back on the palliative care and still be followed for their symptoms. Um, but it's mainly an education thing because it's still a new kind of concept out there. Thank you. Yeah. And feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Uh, can I piggyback off our um, palliative care question? Um, mm -hmm. Do they offer therapy in the home so that 
that person won't feel like, okay, this is my the end of the world for me. They're calling it palliative care. The palliative care, they can have whatever services they, I mean, outside curative stuff that they want, therapy included. The doctor goes to the actual house and makes a house call and um, kind of says, um, this is what you should be doing or can write prescriptions for those medications um, that they need for that um, symptom that they're going through. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, our, our doctor, God bless her, she's all over the place <laughs> because she's our medical director and she goes in homes and visits folks uh, along with our nurse practitioners. Uh, but she's all over the place. Anyway, so. What counties do you serve again? We, in South Carolina, we serve Greenville, Spartanburg, and Cherokee counties. And in North Carolina, we serve Polk County, Rutherford County, and McDowell County. Those are the six counties. Thank you. Thank you.